With their ace on the mound, the New York Mets dropped an absolutely brutal game to watch on Friday. Can they bounce back? I'll talk about that more on today's show. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. All right. Tough game to discuss. Tough night to discuss the Atlanta Braves cruise to a victory over the Royals who backed into a playoff spot. We'll talk about all of that stuff in the final segment, the rest of this and a wild card race and how things didn't necessarily break the Mets way on Friday. Although the Diamondbacks did lose. So that was the one saving grace of the night, but you can't worry about everybody else. That was the whole message of yesterday's show. The Mets have to worry about the games they're playing. No one's going to just hand them a playoff berth, okay? The Diamondbacks could lose out, and if the Mets don't win a game, they're not in. Okay, so this is on the Mets to figure this out. And the last two games they have played have just been awful. Now, this one was extremely frustrating for a variety of circumstances, and a lot of them that weren't necessarily in the Mets' control. First inning. Sean Mania struggles for the first time in a long time. Bryce Terang was a pest all game. Hits a line drive over Francisco Lindor's head that Lindor with a healthy back maybe leaps up and catches, but, I mean, it was a tough play regardless. I don't know if he would have had an extra inch or two on that leap. Regardless, gets into the outfield. Terang reminds us that what the Brewers are going to do is they're just going to run wild. If you thought that the Brewers were going to take it easy on the Mets and they thought that they weren't going to care They're going to play their brand of baseball, and their brand of baseball is extremely annoying to play against. And honestly, it makes me rethink my past notion that the Mets would be better off facing the Brewers than the mighty Padres. The Padres play a game that I feel like the Mets are better suited to counteract, right? That's a team that hits the long ball. That's a team that with good pitching, you can mitigate. With the Brewers, I mean, speed and defense, they just absolutely kill you. And Bryce Terang gets that hit. He steals second. He steals third. Uh, you know, you have Sean Maniah, who briefly looked like he was going to pitch himself out of it. He strikes out Sal Freelich. He gets Jackson Churio to fly out. But then William Contreras draws a walk, and Maniah got squeezed in that at bat by the MVP of the game for the Brewers, which was umpire Ramon De Jesus, who was just ump showing all game long, just all about me, me, me. Brutal calls behind the plate. Had a horrible game. This is one of the worst umpires in baseball. This is the same guy that threw out Jorge Lopez and started this whole run. So it's very serendipitous that he becomes a figure again. If you don't remember Jorge Lopez, before he launched his glove in the stands, the reason why he was walking off the field is he got ejected for just like looking in Ramon De Jesus's direction. So here he is again, horrible strike zone all night. And for some reason, It felt one-sided. Now, do I think that Ramon De Jesus has something out on the Mets because of that incident or anything else? No, I think he's just bad at his job. But tonight, his errors were constantly coming up in big spots, hurting the Mets. That walk to Contreras was one of them, extends the inning. Willie Adamas walks to load the bases. And then you can't blame the umpire on this one. Sean Manai gets ahead 0-2 against Reese Hoskins. There was a couple of pitches nowhere near the zone, so the count becomes even. And then he just throws a fastball right down the middle. And of course, it's Reese Hoskins that hits the grand slam that basically breaks your back before the game even really gets started. Reese Hoskins, who's on the Brewers, hasn't even had a great year. I mean, he's driven in runs, he's in home runs. But overall, if you look at his average, his OPS, uh, WRC+, all these other metrics, hasn't even been that good of a hitter. But he can come through with a big swing, and he does that and just... Again, a backbreaker. Nowhere, nowhere, no other way I can describe it. Then, next half inning, top of the second, Jose Iglesias extends his hitting streak to 18 games. Jesse Winker looks awful and strikes out. 
J.D. Martinez finally hits a ball hard, 106 miles per hour off the bat, but it's right at uh, Willie Adamas at shortstop. Adamas has the ball eat him up a little bit, but he stays in front of it, hits off his chest, starts rolling towards second base, and Adamas just follows it up, runs it down, scoops it with his glove, and just 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 taps it further to Bryce Terang. And you know that shovel on the floor. They turn a double play on that on that grounder. Just a ridiculous turn. And at that moment, I knew the Mets were going to lose. I just, I had a couple of fleeting moments in this game where I thought they might get back in it, but the combination of Manaya getting squeezed, you know, in the first inning with the strike zone, giving up the grand slam. To then see a rally get killed on a ball that was ripped right out of the shortstop where it hit off his chest, ate him up, but he was able to stay with it and got two outs out of it. I'm just like, yeah, the Mets are screwed in this game. Bottom of the second inning, Francisco Lindor makes an error, and he did not look good at shortstop in this game. He looked good hitting, but at short, he was, you know, he didn't have as much on his arm as you usually see with Francisco Lindor. And you can just tell he's playing through this, which. It's great that he's soldiering on here, and I still think the Mets are a better team with Francisco Lindor in the lineup, but it might be a DH. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next segment. That error ends up resulting in a run, so the Brewers are up 5-0. Third inning, Francisco Alvarez draws a leadoff walk. A few batters later with two outs, Mark Vientos comes up. He hits a home run, 27th of the season, 70th RBI by driving in those two runs, 5-2 to two Mets. Sean and I were trying to lead off single in the third. The Mets start a two-out rally in the fourth. This is one of those fleeting moments where I thought they might get back in it. Jesse Winker got hit by a pitch. J.D. Martinez drew a walk. Francisco Alvarez has a great at-bat, works a full count, and clearly looks at ball four. You're going to have bases loaded with the chance where one hit, you're right back in this game. But here comes the ump show again. Ramon De Jesus rings him up. Alvarez loses his mind, and I am stunned that he didn't get immediately tossed. Carlos Mendoza goes out there to defend his player, and at that moment, it was like, sweet, I got someone I could throw out. Mendoza gets tossed. So now you don't have your manager for the rest of the game. And you really missed your big opportunity to get back in and to actually grab the momentum because the Mets, for a fleeting moment with the home run and then the two-out rally getting a couple guys on and it should have been bases loaded, they could have grabbed that momentum back and then, all of a sudden, Tyrone Taylor hits a double, clears the bases to the tie game. The Brewers might not you know, follow through at that point. They might not have it in them in a game that doesn't matter to keep on pushing, to keep on pressing, and you might take that momentum and carry it. Instead, it's still 5-2. to two. Bottom of the fourth inning, Shamanai gets the first two outs. Then he gives up a single on a swinging bunt. Bryce Terang, like I said, a pest. Garrett Mitchell, who came in for South Fruit, who had an ugly collision with the wall. I mean, just brutal. I can't remember what inning that was, but he it was Francisco Alvarez. So I guess it would have been the third inning. Alvarez, before he walked um, in the third, he hit a fly ball on the right field line, and Friedlick tries to make a leaping catch into the wall. Uh, and just there's like a, a, a jutting of where I guess there's like a window into that wall for whatever reason and just backslammed right into it. I didn't see what ended up happening with him, um, if he's going to be okay. It didn't look like it. I mean, could barely walk off the field. So Garrett Mitchell is in the game in his spot in the lineup. He hits a chopper that just somehow bounces completely way above Pete Alonso's head, had no shot at it. And a chopper turns into a double that scores a run. Um, actually, didn't score a run. It was first and third. The next uh, batter drove in the run. That was Jackson Churio, who ripped one that Jose Iglesias made an incredible stop on, but he just could not get enough on the throw in Churio. As wheels, he beats it out, run scores. All of a sudden, another run charge to Manaya. Jose Budo comes on to get out of the jam. So it's 6-2 Brewers. Danny Young comes on after Jose Budo puts up another scoreless frame. And Danny Young, pair of walks and wild pitches. He gives up a run. It's 7-2 Brewers. Mets made a stand in the eighth inning. Uh, Brandon Nimmo, Pete Alonso each singled. I can't remember if that was the at-bat. I think it was a strikeout prior to that. There was also a strikeout with Mark Vientos where he struck out on a check swing where he clearly did not go. So again, just all these calls that went against the match just showed you it wasn't their night. Again, eighth inning, Nimmo and Alonso each single with one out. Jose Iglesias 
hit by a pitch. You got the bases loaded. Harrison Bader hits one that you thought might have had a chance, but you were really just hoping it would get down. Jackson Churio makes a leaping catch into the wall. And if that ball falls, if he doesn't make the catch, it's a bases clearing triple and you got a shot again, but he does make the catch and you only get one run. The Mets score another on an error as JD Martinez pops up and Bryce Terrain couldn't catch it. Uh, so again, fleeting moment. You thought, oh, maybe some luck is turning, but Francisco Alvarez had exited the game. I think it was an inning prior as he was running the bases and was sliding into third. And he just had back spasms, which we'll talk about a little bit more in the next segment. Luis Torrens hitting in his spot, comes up there with two runners on. They go to the bullpen. Holby Milner had gotten pulled because he had really struggled. So they go to the pen. They get uh, McGill, uh, not the Mets McGill, the Brewers McGill, Trevor McGill. Uh, and first pitch swing and Torrens pops out. So bad approach there by Torrens. Alex Young gives up around the eighth inning. Not that it mattered. Solo homer by Gary Sanchez to lead things off. Mets fail to score in the ninth. They drop by a score of eight to four. Just a horrible game all the way around. Shaw Manaya, really rough performance at a must win game. So hopefully he could bounce back if he pitches again this year, which at this point, I mean, you might see him what? Could he even pitch on Monday? What would that be? That would be two days rest. So no. Uh, best chance to see him is. Game one of the wild card round on three days rest or game two on regular rest if the Mets are fortunate enough to even get there. But we got a lot to talk about when it comes to that. Next segment, I just want to focus on the next game here. What can the Mets do to bounce back? Who should be in the starting lineup? Who's going to pitch? We're going to go through all of that in just a minute. First, though, quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Hey, NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, and so much more on the same page where you place bets. You'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. That's again, $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. You don't even have to win the bet. It is guaranteed. That's FanDuel.com, America's number one sports book. Stay up to date with all the lists in the world of sports when you check out Locked On Sports Today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube. If you're watching on YouTube, do me a favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our goal is to get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the season. Appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. All right. Let's lay out the road for the Mets in this next game. What do they do? First things first. Francisco Alvarez with the back spasms. Apparently, if your name is Francisco and you're on the Mets, you're going to have back issues at the end of the season. Just brutal to see him go down like that. Luckily, it was back spasms. I know it's weird to say luckily, but back spasms can look a lot worse than they really are. Now, they could be cause for a more underlying issue. We'll see how he wakes up tomorrow. But I do think when you're talking about, you know, was he 22 years old, Alvarez? When you're talking about a kid this young, to have back spasms, it's unfortunate, but it could just be an isolated incident. It might not happen again. So hopefully the Mets are okay with this one. We'll see. Honestly, I kind of think even though it was a terrible approach by Terenz and offensively Alvarez is the better option, I think Terenz might be the answer in this series anyway because he gives you the best shot at controlling the running game. So if you have Terence back there, at least you have a better catcher back there. Now, with Alvarez, there's something to be said about his pitch framing, his leadership, all of that stuff, the way he calls the game. But when it comes to pass balls right now, he has not been good. And when it comes to controlling the running game, he's been bad. Um, Terence, at least when it comes to the running game, he's excellent. So against this blazing quick Brewers team, it might make sense to start Terenz anyway and give Alvarez his back a day to rest here. Uh, you're going to see Terenz at some point because, I don't know, I don't think that Alvarez will catch both games of a doubleheader on Monday if and when we get there. So Terenz, we'll see if he can swing it a little bit better. It's been pretty bad at the plate for a while now, but to control the running game and because of this back issue, I'd imagine he's starting on Saturday. When it comes to other options, if the Mets have to put Alvarez on the IL, or even if they 
just need a, another option. If they decide they need a third catcher because he's day to day and you need a backup, what they would do is they would DFA Eddie Alvarez. You have Luis and Helicuna. You don't need Eddie Alvarez that much anyway. He's not going to be a possible player on a playoff roster. So you can grab a catcher. And if Alvarez ends up being out, that catcher would be eligible to be added to your playoff roster. If you look at who was playing in AAA at the end of the season, it was Austin Allen, Joe Hudson, or Hayden Sanger. I think Austin Allen might be the most likely guy because there's a little bit of MLB experience there. He's the best bat, eight home runs, 704 OPS in Syracuse this year. Not great, but better than the other options. Or you just go with the best defender. And Hayden Sanger has long been a Mets prospect who's sort of just glove first, glove only, but a fantastic defensive catcher. So maybe you just lean defense with that spot and you call on, on Sanger. Uh, Carlos Mendoza did not name anybody, but he said they had a couple guys in Port St. Lucie ready to go if they needed somebody. So I imagine someone's on a flight regardless here. Uh, I would think it might be, I don't know. I, I Part of me thinks it might just be Sanger to get the glove. I, I think it'll be either Sanger or Allen, but just because I said that, Maybe it's Joe Hudson. I don't know much about Joe Hudson. 33-year-old catcher. Didn't have good numbers in Syracuse. I have no idea how good he is defensively. So take that for what you will. Whoever comes up, Terenz is going to catch these games, though. I'll, I'll tell you that. Uh, all right. Now let's talk about Lindor, the other Francisco with back issues. He was in there. He played the whole game. He made some plays. He made an error. He made some bad throws. He did not look like himself. It, it's clear that Francisco Lindor is playing through it. now. This was his first game playing through this back issue. Maybe he starts to get better as he adjusts to what his body is capable of. Uh, but he's clearly struggling. It, it's just obvious watching. This is not the same Francisco Lindor. Now, with that said, he got on base in three of his five plate appearances. So Lindor's bat's got to be in the lineup. The question is, do you start him at shortstop or do you say, listen, we're going to DH you because we're getting nothing from Jesse Winker or J.D. Martinez right now anyway. And Luis and Helicuna is a spark plug that right now is the best defensive shortstop on this team. Because I'm sorry, whatever percentage you have of Lindor right now, he is not as good as Acuna, and it might not even be close. So if you want your best defensive team out there, you might have to start Acuna and put Lindor at DH. And I think I probably would do that, honestly. From what I saw tonight, the other side of the argument, though, is it's the first game. Like Lindor might be able to work himself into it a little bit. And depending on who pitches for the Brewers, you would likely prefer to have your veterans in the lineup than Luis and Alcuna. As great as he's looked, we'll see the decision the Mets make. Because if you're just not going to play Martinez or Winker, which is what I would suggest at this point, they've been so bad and you're running out of time, I'd prefer the Mets to stick Bader in there, honestly, because, look, Bader had one at bat, and he nearly broke the game back. Or not broke the game up, but he nearly got you back in the game. Um, had a really good at bat, and I feel like with that outfield they have in Milwaukee, you kind of want some guys that can run down fly balls. If you can have Bader in center, Taylor in right, you have a much better defense. So that's one option to go that route, and if you're going to play Lindor at shortstop, all right, strong and Martek and DH. Marte's at bats, even though he hasn't set the world on fire, he's looked a lot better in the box than Winker or JD Martinez. So I think he's got to be in there regardless, whether it's in right field with Taylor or Bader in center, um, with somebody else at DH. If it is Lindor with Acuna at shortstop, we'll see. Uh, but that's sort of I think the dilemma is right now. Not to mention Jose Iglesias, was it did he he got hit by the pitch? Um, but he he wasn't running great either. Now, I think Iglesias is a gamer that'll play through it. I'm sure he's fine. But that's like another little thing to watch here. Iglesias is a little bit banged up. Maybe you need Acuna at second base. So it, it, it's it's a rough one right now. It seems like everything that can go wrong will go wrong. It's the old expression. I tried to push back on that on yesterday's show, saying you can't just default to that. Try to have some faith. As much as I preach confidence, and as much as I'm still going to go into that game, believe in the Mets, are going to win it, and the Mets will make the playoffs when this thing's all said and done. It is very hard to not have your confidence in this team shaken after what we just watched tonight. I mean, it was just one of those games that felt so eerily similar to 
the handful of collapses we have seen in our recent memory that makes you think, here we go again. And, and you don't want to say that. You don't want to put that out into the ether. But man, was that a brutal game to watch. So now you got to bounce back. And I'll talk about all the different scenarios in the next segment. If this team wins that, we can get into that. And we will. But first and foremost, if the Mets don't stop this kid and start playing better baseball, they're not going to make the playoffs. They have to win these games because if they win these games, they can at least put themselves in a position where they only have to win one game if that doubleheader is necessary. They don't have to sweep it. Yes, the Mets are going to play that doubleheader regardless. If they lose the next two games, they can still find their way into the playoffs by sweeping the Braves in that doubleheader. They can still get there. But that's going to be so tough to do, to sweep what's likely going to be Spencer Schwellenbach and Chris Sale in that doubleheader. Good luck. Good luck. So if you're the Mets right now, you got to win the first game. And I am actually pretty happy with the starter they're going with. I thought it might be David Peterson. It's going to be Jose Quintana. And I really like that decision because, you know, Mania, maybe he was phased a little bit tonight. How many big games has Sean Mania pitched in in his career? I know there was some playoff berths with Oakland, but was he the ace of the athletics? I mean, I guess some of those teams he might have been. I have to go back and really look at it, but not in the way that I think he was pitching this year for the Mets. And I don't know if he felt that pressure, and that's what got to him tonight, but. I like the idea of sending Katana out there because, for one, he hasn't pitched in a long time and you want to get him back into some kind of a rhythm. But more importantly, this is a guy that has been there before. He's going to go out there to execute his game plan, and I feel fairly confident that he can do that against a team that typically has struggled a little bit more against left-handed pitching. And I also think that you're sort of saving yourself the possibility of having your better arms, Peterson and Severino, to go into that doubleheader against, again, potentially Schwellenbach and Sale to have at least a fighting chance if you need one of or both of those games. So Quintana is a good option here. The Mets got to play better all around, but if you win this game, some better possibilities will open up for you on Sunday. So let's talk about all of those in just a minute. First, though, quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. Game Time has a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes it easier to get tickets for your favorite live events because they'll filter out all the fluff and only show you incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste your time searching through thousands of tickets. My brother-in-law, Brad O, he is in Chicago, so he can actually make that drive to Milwaukee. He told me he was thinking about it. We need the the Finkelstein luck here. He's an honorary of Finkelstein. He's really a Fletcher, but, you know, he married a Finkelstein. So go out there, Brado, and when you go out there to watch those games, use Game Time because that's the place to get the best possible deals. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's Game Time. If you're an everyday listener of the show, make sure you become a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where you get updates from me anytime news breaks on the Mets. You can ask me questions anytime. You can also take part in our Locked On Mets signed photo giveaways and get the live graphic sent your phone each day so you know who's in the starting lineup without ever going to social media. If you want to be a Locked On Mets insider, find a link in the episode description. Go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. All right, let's talk about the other teams in this NL wildcard race. I briefly mentioned it. Braves won, Diamondbacks lost. But let's go through the specific games here. The Braves started an hour before the Mets. So if you're like me, I was keyed in and watching that game. Early on, nobody scored first couple innings. Brady Singer was matching Max Fried, who was brilliant for the Braves. Fortunately, Sean Murphy hit a two-run homer in the fourth inning, and that was all Fried needed. Fried was going to go the rest of the way. And he nearly did. Through eight innings, Max Free was at 83 pitches. He'd allowed just two hits and one walk. Ninth inning, he gets the first two outs, but then he walks Bobby Witt Jr., gives up a double, so there's runners at second and third, two outs. And Brian Snicker goes to his closer, Rizal Iglesias, to face Salvador Perez. He didn't want Perez to get a matchup against a lefty. Iglesias actually threw him a hanging slider right down the middle, and Salvi did get a barrel on it. Hit it really hard, 98, 99 miles per hour, but he got under it. So the ball didn't even get to the warning track. 
and the Braves win three nothing. Now, what makes matters worse in this situation, the Royals had a magic number of one. So they went into the clubhouse, they turned on the Twins game, and they watched as the Twins blew another game, and they didn't even have a chance in it. They were losing from the outset and just never got in it. So the Royals backed into the playoffs. The Tigers also in the playoffs. There's really nothing left to play for for the Kansas City Royals. On the surface, you'd say, oh, what about seeding? Well, the Royals could still get the fifth seed, and that is a better matchup, the Orioles instead of the Astros. But by losing tonight, the Tigers winning, the Tigers now have a game lead. And who are the Tigers playing? They're playing the Chicago White Sox. Now, the White Sox had swept the Angels to start the week, so there was some thought, and I wrote an article about this for just baseball, that, hey, maybe this is some weird baseball gods voodoo magic where there's never been a team to get to 121 losses in the modern era. Maybe it's just not supposed to happen. Maybe that Mets record is supposed to hold true. But guess what? It finally fell. They got to 121 losses. They're going to get swept. I would be almost sure of it because the Tigers, they got something to play for. Are they going to burn their pitching to the ground? No, but they're playing a team that they can easily beat. They're riding a six-game winning streak now, and they went into Baltimore just last weekend and beat the Orioles in a series that's the matchup they want. They just did it. They have a young team, so you can lean on that past experience. We just went into Baltimore. We just won a series. You don't want to play the Astros, and you have the matchup to push for it. Meanwhile, the Royals are going up against a Braves team that desperately needs these games. Why should they push for seeding? Doesn't matter for them. So Seth Lugo was going to pitch on Saturday. Could have still pitched and conceivably came back for game three of a wild card round. They're not going to do that. Lugo's not going to pitch. Cole Reagans was slated to pitch on Sunday if they needed it. He's not pitching. So who knows who's throwing these games? The Braves are going to win the final two games against the Royals. I'd be shocked if they lost one of these games because Bobby Witt Jr., is he going to be in the lineup? I don't know. Probably not. Why would they? Is Salvador Perez going to be in the lineup? Definitely not. They're going to give his legs a couple days to rest. So they're going to go up against a Royals team that's just not going to care. So if there's one thing I'm sure of at this point, the Braves aren't losing. If the Mets want the Braves out of the playoffs, they're going to have to do it themselves. They're going to get those next two wins. The Mets and the Braves are even right now in the standings at 87 um, and 71. The Braves are going to have 89 wins by the end of the weekend. They just are. Now let's talk about the other side of it. The Padres beat the, the Diamondbacks. The Diamondbacks lost this one, but this is a double-edged sword. Had the Mets won tonight, the Padres would still have something to play for on Saturday because the Mets could still conceivably run the table and get the first wild card spot. Well, now, since the Mets lost, Padres won, Diamondbacks can't catch them, Mets can't catch them, Braves can't catch them. The Padres are in. They're hosting the series. They have everything locked up. They got no reason to play in the next two games. Now, the Brewers have no reason to play, and they played a great game on Friday night. So, the Padres still could have a little bit of pride, the guys that are in the starting lineup, but who's going to be in the starting lineup? Are the Padres going to play Manny Machado? Are they going to play Fernando Tatis? Are they going to play Luis Arise when he's in line for a bag title? Or are they just going to rest all these guys? I mean, who knows what lineup they put forth? I'd imagine they would start all the guys on their bench. And who are they going to pitch? They're probably just going to do whatever they can to avoid throwing their main guys. Yes, they're still going to have some of the relievers pitch, but are they even going to worry about they're throwing Robert Suarez out there? Maybe to get him a little bit of work in a safe situation on Sunday just because you're going to still have a day off, but likely they want to give their guys rest. So I look at the rest of this weekend, and it feels like the Diamondbacks and the Braves have a better path to winning these last two games because their teams they're playing against have nothing to play for same thing is true for the Mets, but the Brewers are a young team. That's the thing. They don't need to rest their guys. I mean, unfortunately tonight, they had a guy that they lost trying to go for it because you know a young player only knows one way to play, and that's what you run into. I'm sure they're going to have a conversation with their guys. Hey, on a ball close to the wall, let's not go leaping into it. But, I mean, how many plays like that are you going to get in a game? And Jackson Churio saved the game, making one of those plays later. And if South Freelick had 
jumped into any other part of the wall, he probably would have been fine. So I feel like the Brewers are going to be the team that's pushing the hardest here because I think they kind of like the idea of knocking the Mets out of this thing, or at least making it hard of them because they want to keep that mental edge. You might face the Mets. If the Mets sweep the Braves in the doubleheader, even after getting swept by the Brewers, they're still in and they're going to probably go up against the Brewers. So it feels like the Mets have the worst road now, at least for this weekend. Now, the reality is you still can go into Atlanta and sweep the Braves in a doubleheader and make it, but that is a tough, tough task. So in this instance, what you want to do is you want to sweep. Not sweep, geez. You want to win. You can't sweep if you lost the first game, Ryan. You want to win these next two because if you win these next two and the Diamondbacks win these next two, you don't have to sweep the doubleheader to get in. The Mets would be at 89 wins. The Diamondbacks would be at 90 wins. You would just need one game in that doubleheader. There's a world where all three of these teams, the Mets, the Braves, and the Diamondbacks, each win their final two games this weekend. The Diamondbacks would enter Monday with a game up in the win column. But if the Mets and the Braves split the doubleheader, each of them would go in. That's the position you want to be in. Maybe something happens. Maybe the Diamondbacks lose both games. Maybe the Braves lose some games, shockingly. You never know. It's baseball. Anything can happen. But for the Mets right now, all you can focus on is the next game. And all these other scenarios, we'll talk about them as they come up. I mean, to give you like a brief rundown, if the Diamondbacks lose one more game and the Mets and Braves each went out, then no doubleheader has to be played because they're all going to finish at the same win total on Sunday. And Major League Baseball would say, hey, Mets, Braves, you guys cool with calling it and giving the Braves the fifth seed and the Mets take the sixth seed? Mets would say, you know what? Yeah, we'll stay in Milwaukee and we'll we'll not worry about going and playing a doubleheader in Atlanta and exhausting our pitch. And we'll take the rest day, recuperate, and, and focus on that game. That can still happen. I could see the Padres winning one of these two games a little bit more than I could see the Royals winning one of these two games because the Padres are just a better team. The Royals, they've made the playoffs here, and I don't want to knock them too much. It's been a good season, but I've sort of been down on them all year with our coverage of just baseball. I do the power rankings and everything else. I've always had them a little bit lower than I think the general consensus. And the reason why I have is because you look at that division, the AL Central, so many of those teams have gotten fat just beating up on the White Sox when it comes to their record. And the Royals are one of them. The Royals are 12 and 1 this year when playing the White Sox. The Twins, 12 and 1 when playing the White Sox. Now the Tigers are 10 and 1 playing the White Sox with two left to play. The only team who hasn't completely destroyed the White Sox this year, funny enough, is the first place team, the Guardians, who went 8 and 5 against them. So the Royals are just not a good enough team to put their C plus effort out there and beat the Braves. I just can't see it. The Padres, could they win one of these two games? I think it's possible, in which case, if the Mets went out, big sigh of relief, you don't have to go into Atlanta. Now, if the Diamondbacks went out, again, that doubleheader will have to be played. But if you win out, you only have to win one. All the other scenarios, you just don't want to be put in a position where you have to sweep the Braves in that doubleheader. Yes, we talked at the beginning of the week about how the Mets controlled their fate. If they won a series in Atlanta, they were going to be in. But the way things have shaped up here, where the Braves could probably be comfortably in the driver's seat, they're not going to pitch Sale, they're not going to pitch Schwellenbach until that doubleheader. Schwellenbach won't be good to go until that doubleheader anyway. Um, actually, I guess he could pitch on Sunday, technically. But if you're the Braves, you're going to save him. Because if you can get in without using them, well, now you got Freed, Schwellenbach could go game one, or actually Sale could. It could be Sale, Freed, Schwellenbach. That's what they'd want. Now, what I think they're planning on, the reason why they said they're not going to pitch Chris Sale until they get to an elimination game is because of exactly what happened tonight. The Royals now have nothing to play for. Max Freed got the big first win for you when the Royals were still going to give you their best punch. Now... They're going to go Ronaldo Lopez off the IL, see what they have in him before the playoffs anyway. I don't know how many innings he'll pitch, but coming off the IL, that's kind of a anyone's guess what he's going to look like. Maybe that helps the Mets. Maybe Lopez blows up. I doubt it, but you never know. Once you get to that double header, they can go if it really matters. And if the Mets are, are in a position where they have to win both, 
basic or I'll put it this way if the Braves need to win a game because there's a world where the Mets need the doubleheader and the Braves don't but to not get too in the weeds on that until we get to it if the Braves had to win just one game in that doubleheader they can go Schwellenbach game one if they don't win all right fine we'll pitch Chris Sale so we'll see I think the thing that Mets fans don't want is to have to see them sweep the Braves but if that's what it comes down to, that's what it comes down to. And we're going to watch them all regardless. And I'll be with you after every game on the show. So make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. You know what I'm talking about tomorrow, whatever happens on Saturday. Uh, so we'll go through it all. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Goal is to get to 10,000 subscribers by the end of the season. So I appreciate all of you who continue to subscribe. You can follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listener, your first watch every day. After your second watch, head over to YouTube and check out the first ever 24-7 streaming channel. It covers everything, the world of sports. Talking about Locked On Sports today with our local experts from each team, league-wide experts from each league. Find Locked On Sports today, streaming 24-7 on YouTube.